All right, I'll try and make this quick. As it says there, the bonding electrons of a co covalent bond are not always located between the two bonded atoms. Even though we draw that little dashed line, it's not realistic where it always is. We can see what's called delocalized bonding. And the bonding pair of electrons can be spread over a number of the atoms rather than just localized between the two atoms. When this is happening, we can't just use a single electron dot formula. We need to show what's called resonance, showing all of the possible electron dot formulas. So here's some car carbon, sorry, <laughs> common examples. The carbonate ion. So the carbonate ion is CO3 minus 2. And you can see that we can have the double bond between the carbon and this oxygen here or here. So what ends up happening is we have all of that, so to speak, and there is a resonance structure. So we have these dashed lines. That basically means that the electrons, the bonding, is occurring spread out over all of those atoms. Same thing is happening in ozone. Here can be the double bond O. Here can be the double bond O. And so we see that the averaged structure of ozo ozone shows the delocal delocalized molecular orbital. And again, we can get a little more in depth with this when we start talking about the molecular orbital theory. But here's another extremely important compound that you might have seen before, benzene, the benzene ring. And there's alternating single and double bonds between the carbon atoms in the benzene ring. And so this is like the universal symbol for benzene. And that circle is showing resonance. Now, the double arrows doesn't mean that the molecule flips back and forth between these structures. There's only one benzene molecule. There's only one ozone molecule. There's just a blending of those electron clouds, and the electrons are not just found static in between the two atoms. So let's look um, how this can be important to us. First of all, uh, we see this in metallic bonding, like that lovely video showed us. Positive metal nuclei are surrounded by a sea or swarm of delocalized electrons. And this is what gives our metals their very, very important characteristics. They're shiny, which the video said gave metals their luster. They are malleable, meaning we can hammer them and mold them and bend them. They're ductile. We can stretch metals out into wire copper wires and of course they can conduct electricity because they've got that swarm of electrons we can easily get elect electrons to flow through these metals so that's one very important aspect of this delocalized bonding now in combination with the resonance we can look at this concept of formal charge if you want like a, an, an official definition of this, you can look at page 355 of your book. But essentially, we can use formal charge to determine the best Lewis formula for a molecule between the resonance structures. And so here we have COCl2 again. We worked with this molecule in the last little video when we were first showing Lewis structures. And here are three resonance structures that are possible for the COCl2. Okay, I had mentioned back then that we really can't form a double bond with chlorine, and that's normally true. But technically speaking, we could draw these three different resonance structures. So what I want to do is figure out the formal charge for each of the atoms. And what that means is each atom gets half of the electrons that are that it's associated with and with the bond and any lone pairs that are around it, then they get both of those electrons. And so we can calculate a formal charge here. We take the number of valence electrons for that atom, and we subtract the number of electrons it has in the bond, plus the number of lone pairs it has. So if we look here, first off, at all the carbons, they all have a formal charge of zero. Carbon has four valence electrons, and then each of those, there's no lone pairs around them, but there are one, two, three, four electrons that carbon gets because of the bonds. So four minus four, the formal charge of carbon is zero. We don't have to write that 
on the formula, on the structure. Um, so let's look at the oxygen. Okay, and if we look at the single bonded oxygen, oxygen has six valence electrons. And so it has one bond here. So there's one electron that it's responsible for plus the six valence electron or six lone pair electrons. Okay, so six minus seven, that gives oxygen a formal charge of minus zero. So I can place that on the structure. And again, that's when we had a single bonded oxygen. What about the chlorine? Okay, the chlorine, chlorine has seven valence electrons. And so we will subtract, it's attached by one bond. And it has six lone pairs, so seven minus seven. So the single bonded chlorines are, also have a formal charge of zero. But the double bonded chlorine, okay, again, seven valence electrons minus two electrons in the bond plus four lone pair electrons. So that equals a positive one. And so I put that formal charge on the molecule as well. So again, the carbons and the single bonded chlorines both have formal charges of zero. And so you can see in that middle molecule, no formal charges are written. Oh, sorry, there's also a double bonded oxygen there. Double bonded oxygen, oxygen has six valence electrons minus two electrons in the bond and the four valence electrons, that's also zero. The double bonded chlorines and the single bonded oxygen have the formal charges. I know that looks a little messy there. But what we can do then is figure out which structure is better. Now please notice, for whatever reason, wherever I got the, this picture from, they had the formal charge in the wrong spot. So make sure you correct your picture because I moved the positive charges. All right, so make sure you correct your picture. So now, which structure is better? A, the one with the lowest magnitudes of formal charges. And because of rule A, this is the best option. And that's the one we drew back when we were just drawing the simple Lewis structure. The other two aren't horrible, but that structure does not have any formal charges. If two options have the same formal charge magnitudes, then we want to choose the one having the negative formal charge on the more electronegative atom. And when possible, choose a Lewis structure that does not have like charges on adjacent atoms. And perhaps we'll see a couple examples here. The last little thing I want to mention about formal charges, the sum of formal charges equals the charge of the molecular species. So here we just have COCl2. It's a molecule and its charge is zero. So the sum of the formal charges, even over here, negative one, positive one, are zero. If we're putting formal charges on a polyatomic ion, then the sum of those formal charges will have to equal the charge of that polyatomic ion. We can also use formal charge to help with writing the skeleton structure of a molecule. So here we have SOCl2. And what we can do is figure out which skeleton is going to be better. So let me set up a couple skeletons for you to copy down. So here we have three possible scenarios. Sulfur being the central atom, oxygen being the central atom, chlorine being the central atom. All three of these, they all are obeying the octet rule. There's 26 valence electrons, six from sulfur, six from oxygen, seven and seven from chlorine. So what we can do is we can assign formal charges, okay? And so when I do that, 
all of the single bonded chlorines, those are zero, just like they were in the last example. They have seven valence electrons, one electron in the bond, six in the lone pair. Seven minus seven is zero. So let's look at sulfur. Sulfur here has six valence electrons minus three in the bond and two in the lone pair. Six minus five is equal to plus one. Okay. So the formal charge of sulfur, I'm going to get rid of that so I can put it here, is plus one. Oxygen here, I've got six valence electrons, electrons for oxygen, minus one in the bond and six around it. So that's a negative one. So the formal charge of oxygen there is minus one. In the middle, Oxygen, six valence electrons, three in the bond, two there, minus one. Sulfur ends up being, I'm sorry, that's a plus one. Six minus five is plus one. Sulfur has six valence electrons, minus one in the bond, and six lone. That's negative one. Over here, single bonded chlorine is okay. Sulfur. 6 minus 1 in the bond, 6 around it, so that's negative 1. Oxygen, like it was on the left-hand side, is going to be negative 1 also. And this chlorine, wow, 7 valence electrons minus 3 electrons in the bond plus the 2 on the lone pair, and that equals plus 2. So there we have the three possibilities, okay? And I'm going to first off eliminate that one. It's got a plus two on the chlorine and the two negative ones. So there's formal charges everywhere, a high magnitude of plus two, so that one's gone. So looking at the next two structures, okay, I have two options. Same formal charge magnitudes, plus one, minus one. I'm going to choose the one having the negative formal charge on the more electronegative atom. Oxygen is more electronegative than sulfur, or is sulfur more electronegative than oxygen? So when I check my electronegativities, oxygen is indeed more electronegative. This is the option that I would choose. And actually, that makes sense. Sulfur is less electronegative, and you see it there as the central atom. In all actuality, haha, of course, what we end up seeing happening is we've got sulfur indeed as the central atom. Chlorines on both sides, and a double bonded oxygen. When I do that, there are no formal charges. And sulfur still has a lone pair, and it ends up with 10 valence electrons. But that's OK, because it is one of those exceptions to the octet rule. So again, don't get overly bogged down by this. It is what it is. And so there will be times where they'll ask you to check using formal charges, and we'll do some practicing with everything we've looked at so far. And we will hopefully become more skilled at our Lewis dot structure formulas, resonance, and formal charges. See ya soon.